Well, hello. Hi, I'm, I'm Alison Bennett. I'm a PhD student here at Deakin. I'm going to be talking about a body of work that I exhibited just recently at Deakin University Art Gallery. So um, let me just, I'm going to just hide the view of myself so we can go to the slides. Okay. Let's have a look at this. So um, I just had an exhibition at Deakin University Art Gallery. It was called Shifting Skin. It's part of my PhD research and I'm about halfway through my PhD. I'm doing a creative practice as research. So I'm actually in the process of investigating ideas and possibilities through the process of making artworks rather than looking at other people's examples of how they're producing artworks. Um, it's a really interesting process and really engaging. So I've been uh, really quite surprised and, and uh, interested in the kind of response this work has had. The exhibition consisted of 10 very large uh, photographic prints on Hanamula photo rag. And they're all uh, scans of pieces of bodies with tattoos. And I used a flatbed scanner, which I actually held up against uh, people's bodies and rotated it around, around the skin. Um, because a flatbed scanner is not designed to be lifted off the desk and carried around, we had uh, all sorts of interesting glitches happening. So you can see the, the lines through the images in this photograph were created where the gears that drive the scanner actually slipped. And so you get these strange little valleys in, in the images. It's a really lovely space at, at Deakin University Art Gallery. I was incredibly thrilled when I was offered a, an exhibition. The exhibition came about through a, a, comp, a competition, essentially. We were asked, there was an invitation went out for um, high degree research creative arts students to uh, submit a proposal. And the proposal was about, um, they wanted works that demonstrated the creation of knowledge through creative practice. And I was very fortunate to be offered a solo show on the basis of that uh, particular proposal. I think one of the things that uh, has gained attention for this work has been the augmented reality component to the work. And I've got a short video here. Um, this is my colleague Steph, who's uh, a, a quite an amazing dancer and performer. And uh, so she's here with the iPad. And um, she is showing us the other component of the work. The gallery described the exhibition as being two exhibitions in one. So we had um, not only the flat prints, but also an invisible sculptural element to the work as well. So as the iPad moves over the image, we've got a, a sculptural pro projection out of, out of the image. It's kind of like there's a virtual object in, in invisible in space that's being revealed by the iPad as it moves over the image. Um, I, <laughs> she's going to get down low and try and get underneath it. There she is. Um, so, so what I've done to create the 3D image is actually to invert the values in the surface itself. So where it's light, the sculpture comes forward, and where it's dark, the, uh, the shape recedes. It's not a direct replication of the body that I've scanned, but a reflection of the surface details in, in the image. The 3D component was created using a combination of uh, Photoshop and Maya. Um, I am new to Maya, so my colleagues at the Motion Capture Lab helped me find a pathway through that. Oh, I gave a, a, a talk at um, Deakin Open Day just recently, and I was reminded of um, Arthur C. Clarke's third principle of prediction. Arthur C. Clarke is a, uh, a, a futurist and one of his uh, principles is that a sufficiently advanced 
technology should be indistinguishable from magic. And um, the corollary of that is that um, if it doesn't look like magic, then it's not sufficiently advanced. And it was fantastic to have so many people come through the gallery. We had about 500 people through on that day. And quite often there was sort of a sense of disbelief when they realised that there was this virtual floating shape that was attached to the work. And quite often there was a sense of, of awe and magic that was in the response. So for me that was a real affirmation that my engagement with the technology had been successful. I'm, I'm really proud of the fact that the exhibition works not only just as images, um, that the images themselves can stand alone, but that this gesture towards the overlay of both the virtual and the physical was so effective. Um, the 3D objects, as I said, were built out of uh, in Photoshop and Maya, but I've used a augmented reality program called Erasma, um, which is a really straightforward application. The way it works is that it reads the image as like a barcode. The image appears to be um, is like a, a trigger in computer vision, and it's in the internet. It goes up to a database and finds the object that has been associated with that particular uh, image. So the 3D object is, it's not that the application is directly in real time translating the image from 2D to 3D, it's the 3D object is something that I've built and overlaid over the image. It's a little screenshot of one of my favourite images. As I said, the, um, the original scans were made using a flatbed scanner and one of the things that I love about that was the glitches that became evident. So as the gears slipped, um, there was a sort of a breakup of the, of, of the way that the image was captured. So most digital images are captured using sensors that pick up the red, green and blue channels in visible light. And when that all holds together, we get this kind of seamless representation of a photograph. But where it starts to break apart, you can see that the skin tones and the blacks and the hairs have started to break up into the component colours. So we see red, green and blue and the secondary colours of cyan, magenta and yellow. And you can see where we've had to actually pull the scanner away from the skin to re-engage the gears and gives us this quite surreal sort of uncanny valley that sort of slips back and comes back into us. Um, some of you may have seen some of the uh, media coverage of the exhibition and the Mashable video made reference to a moving image work which is actually uh, was a previous Im image um, that I had exhibited a couple, not like long ago, back in, in May. The uh, White Street Project at the Frank Sinatra Arts Centre have a fantastic um, data projection facility and so they were showing a moving image work that I'd done. And the moving image work was a series of screenshots uh, as I actually created the 3D objects. So as I was saying, um, part of the reason I create images is my attempt to make sense of the world. Um, and the research question that I'm looking at involves consideration of surface in digital images. Um, I won't re-quote my question because it's, it would lead me down another path, but I do want to bring your attention to the... Uh, we're just having a question come up. What's this? It's, um, it's, I'm totally new to this webinar format, so uh, I've got the lovely Christian here helping, helping me. So uh, shall I read the question that's been sent through? Yeah. Um, who's the question from? It says here, I hadn't noticed so clearly before the incredible Curacera modelling in 3D forms, but just wondering, Alison, whether there are other um, values sets aside from the light-dark contrast interpretations that might produce um, alternative 3D interpretations. Who, who posed that question, Christian? Uh, Rose. Ah, Rose. Thank you very much, Rose. Um, 
one of the things that's really interesting about um, the digitalization of uh, all media, whether it be sound or um, images or uh, other, other values that we can digitalize, is that everything comes down to ones and zeros. So whether you record sound or record vision, it's a series of ones and zeros. So one of the bases of um, glitch practice is to, for example, convert an image file to a sound file and then make adjustments within a sound editing program and then convert it back to an image. So Rose, there's another series of, of questions that we could ask of the data and find other ways to give ourselves access to um, the information. As you know, my research question is about looking into the nature of surface in digital images and one of the ways I've sought to do that is to invert the relationship between um, surface and volume because these two things are stuck together. You don't have surface without volume, you don't have volume without surface. So Rose, I guess there are other ways that we could begin to um, we could convert and reinterpret the data. So yes, I don't as yet know what that is, but that's why I'm doing creative practices research and I'm only halfway through my research, so I'm not sure where to go next. I'm at a really interesting point because I've just done this major body of work. I've had an exhibition halfway through and I need a little bit of time to process the responses that I've had to it. A big reason why I want to exhibit halfway through my PhD is to get engagement and feedback on the kind of questions that I'm asking. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, augmented reality because it seems to be the thing that people first respond to when they look at this work. Um, and there's all, it's all, uh, when I was working in um, stitch panoramas, the first thing people wanted to do was talk about the process of stitching the panoramas. Now we have a much more, um, people are used to stitch panoramas and so uh, we, people can now engage with the images but now that I've started working in augmented reality we've got a lot more, um, the main interest seems to be in that nature of the technology. However, um, I, it's, I think it's mainly because it's just a, a new and emerging area. The thing that one of the reasons I decided to pursue augmented reality was uh, William Gibson's book, uh, Spook Country. William Gibson is an author that I've been following for a very long time. So he's somebody that informs my imagination. And his book, Spook Country, was about a journalist who was investigating artists who were using augmented reality. Um, so that sort of stuck in the back of my head quite a few years ago when I read, read, read about it. So when it came to investigating the overlay between and the relationship between the physical and the virtual, that seemed like a, a really sensible way to investigate it. i am just got this screen up because I was kind of uh, thrilled, had a bit of a bit of fangirl flutter when this happened. Um, when I, I sent a tweet to William Gibson saying, just for your information, here is uh, a body of work I've been working on that was informed by one of your books, and he actually retweeted it. I was um, quite thrilled and overwhelmed. It was great. So I was left when, with having read this book with an image of the way in which our physical environment is completely enmeshed and overlaid with the virtual and the digital. Um, this is a project from a, a, a European university and I apologise I've um, mislaid the uh, credit for this. I'll put that up on my website to um, address that. It's a project where they did a light painting in photography on a stick that would measure the strength of the Wi-Fi signal across locations. And this is a work by Seth Lambert where he's covered a series of rooms with, uh, with grids. So i am sort of got this image in my head about the way that our physical world and our virtual worlds are deeply enmeshed and overlaid and I wanted to find ways to investigate and talk about that. The other uh, source that has 
informed by imagination is an uh, academic called William Riccio, who wrote an essay a little while ago called The Algorithmic Turn, looking at photosynth and augmented reality and the changing implications of the image. William has been touching on a lot of things that I've been interested in. He kind of works in the realm of what I would call expanded photography. So when I was looking at uh, stitched panoramas, he was also writing about the implications of stitching panoramas. So I was delighted to find that he'd actually written about augmented reality and situated as part of expanded photography, which gave me a sense of, of, of how I might situate my practice as a photographer when engaging with this technology. Question, um, uh, where's my timer? How do I see we're up to with time? Yep, so we've got, we're, we're 29 minutes through? Uh, no, we have uh, 13 more minutes. 13 more minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so augmented reality has lots of fabulous implications for both the image making and photographic practice. I love the way that it's being picked up by culture jammers in order to create uh, sort of billboard interventions. And it's kind of a way in which it can be done without actually sort of crossing over the law at this stage. Um, whilst a lot of culture jammers in the past have had to actually climb up on billboards and paste over them, you can now do that with your iPhone if you know what to look for. Yep. Um, the first time I came across augmented reality was in the point and shoot exhibition at ACME. I was working uh, as an invigilator in the exhibition and so I spent quite a bit of time in 2005 explaining to visitors and demonstrating very simple um, very very simple examples of augmented reality. And in uh, 2011 the Australian Centre for Virtual Art created a virtual exhibition of sculptures called Unseen Sculpture. But the question becomes, why skin and tattoos? I have been um, doing, I started doing scans of my friends' faces in response to an exhibition brief that asked questions about the nature of queer skin. So I asked a couple of my friends who are uh, transgender if I could make images of their facial hair. Um, and I was not quite happy with the results I was getting from the camera, so I actually got my mate and put his face against a flatbed scanner and was thrilled with the result. That then moved into making scans of tattoos and conversations around the role of uh, tattoos as a form of identity and marker and the way in which we write ourselves into existence. This work was exhibited in 2012 as part of uh, the Midsummer Festival here in Melbourne. Um, so this was one of the starting points for investigating the use of skin as a surface. There are a lot of artists who have looked at uh, the use of tattoos. Uh, Will, Will, Will Devo is a notorious example. He uh, actually does tattoos on live pigs and uh, the skins and the, the of the pigs are then sold as artworks. I'm also interested in the work of uh, XD Demichi, who is a tattoo artist who also works in watercolour. So her works are exhibited both as paintings and she does some tattoo work as well. Just an incredible amount of detail in her in her work that is informed by the tattoo aesthetic. This is some of my previous work. Before I started doing scans of uh, tattoos, I was doing uh, stitch panoramas of uh, interior spaces. This is from a work called Cavity. But even though I was doing images of spaces, there's always been at least one work in all my exhibitions that um, have a close examination of surface. So this is back in 2003 and a detail of a floor in a historic house that I was photographing. Um, I wanted to talk about the 
combination of skin and augmented reality and tattoos. It is not something, I'm not the first person to come up with this. There's actually quite a, a deep history in this kind of convergence. As I uh, flicked past earlier, there's a, an academic called Staroeski who has noted that um, there's a tendency to conflate the biological metaphor of skin with the surface, surface of digital media and the metaphors of the digital interface with biological skin. So in terms of our cultural imagination, there's a bit of a, a, a convergence happening around the skin of our bodies and our embodiment and the skin of our interfaces with our, our computer world. Um, this is a great example. Um, 2008, uh, Jim Milkey uh, proposed this uh, speculative design for the Greener Gadgets design competition. So it's actually a tattoo interface of a telephone that's embedded in the skin and it's powered by, um, it's actually powered by blood. I would love my kids to have one of these because they're always losing their mobile phones. And I think this one could be interesting too. You can actually have a, a, a blood alcohol reading that shows up as a tattoo on your arm. There was uh, other examples of a digital interface on skin and tattoos is this work by a Paris-based tattoo artist called Carl and he designed a tattoo that was um, would act as a trigger to a YouTube video and when you place the, the mobile phone against the skin the animation that played would actually fit into the tattoo. Um, if you look, look this up, you'll find that it was broadcast live on Facebook and there's people commenting as he's actually making the tattoo and then demonstrating it. I love the match between the smile of the subject and the smile of the, uh, of the animation as well. Uh, it's a South American group called ThinkinApp who have experimented with the idea of augmented reality tattoos. The trigger image is just a, a square and it creates a view to a animation of a flying uh, dragon in three-dimensional space. And uh, there's a circulating image of someone who has put a Nintendo augmented reality um, stamp on, tattooed onto their wrist so that they can have the character emerge from their body as a, as a character as well. You've probably seen a lot of the uh, emergence of uh, QR to code tattoos, but I think for me this is a, a photograph that was sent to my phone last night from one of my school friends, Billy. Um, in 1986 he had this tattoo of a barcode put onto his forearm and I remember being quite shocked at the time. Um, this, this is 23 years later and you can see that the barcode is probably getting a little blurry as tattoos sometimes do. But in reflection, it's probably the first example I can think of where I've encountered that uh, interface between the idea of a, a digital code and that being embedded as part of the skin. So thank you to Billy for uh, getting in touch with me in just the right time. As I said, there's, it's a bit of a, of a in 1989 and 80, sorry, 1986, that was a pretty radical thing to do. Unfortunately, it's uh, been picked up, so I think, but I think that also picks points to a interest in the cultural imagination of this interface between skin and, and our digital world. The most recent example that uh, I've come across is my friend, um, Anthony Antonellis. This is a screenshot from a video that went viral in the last week or so. Um, shortly after there was a bit of media attention for my, um, for, for my work, Anthony um, did an interview with Animal website in New York where he had a, a, a chip inserted into his arm which broadcast a, a GIF that he had made. Is that another question that's come up there? No? Always more like a troubleshooting. No worries, don't. So, where are, can you give me a time shot, please? Where are we? We have uh, four minutes. Okay. I'm going to close my presentation with uh, 
a preview of some work which is not yet, yet public. Um, I work as a member of the Motion Capture Lab here at Deakin, and it's a really exciting uh, place to be a part of. Let's get this video started. So I work as part of a team that are working on this particular piece of work for the Pause Festival here in, in Melbourne, it, it should be, which runs in February. So we've been shortlisted for the Connect competition, um, which is asking people to make interactive digital artworks that deal with the theme of Connect. So um, the programming behind this was done by my colleague uh, John McCormick and the person driving the work there is my colleague uh, Steph Hutchinson. Um, essentially what it is, it's actually a 3D blob and it um, can be projected in 3D so that you can actually see it floating in space and it's driven through a connect interface and it actually dances with the performer or whoever is in the space. Um, it's not simply mimicking what Steph does, we're working towards um, instilling a measure of artificial intelligence so that the, the blob will actually respond and dance with the performer rather than simply mimic what they're doing. So essentially we're teaching computers how to dance, um, which is probably a good place to leave it, I think. Um, Christian, what happens now? Well, you brought them two questions. Totally, yes. Um, do we have any questions at this point? Um, I'm going to I've scroll to my website. Um, so the exhibition is documented on my website. Uh, from the landing page you can follow the links through to the documentation. Um, and the video that I showed is available there as well as the installation shots of the exhibition. We can this, try to... Ah, so this is the first time that I've done a webinar, so it's still very strange to me. So, uh, Lance, you have a question, so uh, I might just unmute him. Oh, awesome. Hi, Les. Hi. I, I, can, I, I can hear you and I can also see you. Le Les, Les um, is the image that we've got in front of us right now. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm fabulous. This is really exciting. We get you, um, Les has just Hello, back to, Les has just moved to the United States, so I said goodbye just a, a little while ago. So I was wondering, what's the next? Is there a next step with um, with with this project? Uh, are you going to take it any further? Oh, totally. Um, the gallery here at Deakin have um, asked to package it as a touring exhibition. So we're going to be making it available um, both uh, domestically. They're looking at the um, domestic tour, so they're offering the exhibition to uh, regional and uh, galleries around Victoria and interstate. And I'm also chasing up um, some interest overseas. Um, I had a, an email just the other day from an academic asking me if I had secured a, a, an international American venue as yet. So I would love to see it go overseas. Given that there's been such a strong response internationally, I would love to see it go overseas. Well, that would be great. Uh, and would you come with it? I would love to. I think that, that would have to be part of the, the process. I, I um, Yes, that's on my bucket list. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that. Good to hear your voice, darling. It's the same, likewise. Yeah? So that was that was uh, Les, and Les has got this awesome um, tattoo of what he calls the zombie nurse. Um, he lost his leg uh, some time ago in a motorcycle accident, and uh, in memory of that experience, actually had a, a tattoo of the nurse that uh, was involved with the removal of his leg. So it's quite a incredibly profound and uh, powerful image in my mind and um, points to the sort of the, the visceral potential of these kind of images. It, uh, we can get kind of lost and lose connection with the sense of the body 
when we're dealing with digital images and I wanted to find images that brought us back to our sense of being an embodied creature. Alright, um, so we're almost out of time. I'm going to wrap up and um, say thank you for, uh, for logging in. I, this is a new experience for me, but it's fantastic to have the opportunity and the interest to um, begin to engage with ideas about my work. Bye now.